If there's one thing we hate, it's consequences. Why should I have to suffer the consequences for things that past me did? She's an idiot. And yet, we love games, even though they're full of consequences. Sometimes really, really serious consequences. Like when we manage to do a thing that causes another thing that causes us to be irreversibly and unexpectedly screwed over. Like on these seven occasions when we screwed ourselves over in unpredictable ways with irrevocable results. Beware of spoilers for these games. Over here, stranger. Anyone who played Resident Evil 4 will remember the merchant, a travelling salesman who looks like Sub-Zero's fallen on hard times, and who speaks like every day is International Talk Like a Pirate Day. Got something that might interest you. <laughs> The merchant pops up regularly to buy the various treasures you find along the way, as well as to sell you new weapons. He's even got some rare and exclusive stock that he'll give you access to if you're lucky. Stranger! <laughs> what you need that for? Go and hunt an elephant? I... No, it's for all the Ganados and Plagas monsters that are literally everywhere. Have you not seen them? I guess they're not buying much. Anyway, by the end of the game, you will come to view the merchant as your closest and most trusted ally, thanks to him giving you sweet weapons and, unlike the rest of your allies, not dying stupidly, dressing better than you, or getting constantly kidnapped. Leon! Not now, Ashley. Help! Yes, in many ways, the merchant is my best friend. Is that all, stranger? <laughs> it's... it's Leon? We've spoken literally hundreds of times. You know what, it doesn't matter. That said, not everyone is as big a fan of the merchant as we are. In fact, it's actually possible to kill the merchant. Not just possible, but easy, because this guy goes down like a sack of spuds if you so much as wave a weapon in his general direction. Now, you might be thinking that this isn't a big deal, and that he'll either get better or be replaced by a twin brother who can carry on the family business, and who won't have a problem selling useful items to the person who murdered their twin. And on the easier difficulty settings, you'd be right. Got some rare things on sale, stranger. Thanks, man. Sorry about your brother. He just sold me a new gun I really wanted to test out. Anyway, thanks for the new gun. Time to test it out. On professional difficulty, however, once you kill the merchant, he's gone for good. That means from the point you kill the merchant onwards, you're not buying any weapons, upgrading any weapons, or buying any healing items. So good luck fighting the final boss on professional difficulty with an unupgraded handgun, murderer. <laughs> Thank you. Also, you can't do the shooting galleries because they're run by the merchant. Although given that we're supposed to be rescuing the president's daughter and not playing carnival sideshow games, that's probably for the best. Oof. I await your command as promised. The most important thing that Oscar-nominated Scientologist Tom Cruise and I have in common is that we both know what it's like to be stuck in an infinite death loop. Him because of that movie where he got stuck in an infinite death loop, me because of Skyrim. You might have had the same live-die-repeat experience as Tom and I if, while playing Skyrim, you found yourself in a dicey situation and thought, I know, I'm a cautious cat, I'll do a careful little save, just in case the worst happens. And then suddenly, the worst happens. The problem is your quick save respawns you just a split second before your gruesome death. So, reloading your game means you have no time to do anything except look your killer in the eye and think, oh sh**. And when you realise your last manual save is from ages ago and none of your autosaves are any help, then you think, I may have really screwed myself over and lost loads of progress. And when even reloading, then instantly pausing the game and chugging every potion in your pockets doesn't save your skin, then you know you have really screwed yourself over. Hmm, first throw, damn it.
Hailing from an era when video games had fewer pixels than the display on your oven, Space Quest 2 was the second adventure starring Roger Wilco, a corn dog with arms and legs. Wait, that's supposed to be a human man. Wow. Regardless, this is an old school adventure game and the first rule of adventure games is that you investigate literally everything on every single screen. Like this, I want to say locker? Locker. Yes. Contained in this locker on Xenon Orbital Station 4 is the Cubics Rube, a Rubik's Cube style puzzle that's designed to be the first item you collect. Given that this is literally the second room in the entire game though, it's entirely possible that you'll miss the cube because you're distracted wrestling with the fiddly controls and text adventure interaction system required to take off your spacesuit. Um. Oh, get suit. Makes perfect sense. Whether or not you miss picking up the cube, you end up railroaded into a scenario where you're kidnapped and crash land on a distant planet, with no hope of ever making it back to the orbital station. Space Quest 2 then allows you to play a full two thirds of the game, including swimming through underwater caves and avoiding carnivorous plants. before you're faced with the Labion Terror Beast. The only way to survive this encounter is distracting him with the cube. You know, the one you left in a locker. In space. Now your only options are either to quit and start the whole game again, or just allow yourself to be shredded by the Tasmanian Devil's interstellar cousin. Maybe he just likes corn dogs. Wait, no, human man, got it. <laughs> Undertale is surprisingly deep for a game in which a talking skeleton pranks you with a whoopee cushion. Undertale can be played in one of two main ways. You can either go full pacifist, finding creative ways to spare every enemy you encounter throughout the game. Or you can choose to embrace the dark side and kill everything that crosses your path. Or you could do a bit of both, but honestly, why bother? Go big or go home! Anyway, if you weren't aware of all that before you played Undertale, who could blame you for playing it through the first time the way that you play every single other RPG in existence? By killing your enemies. Indeed, the game is kind of set up to lead you down this path. Your first encounter with Flowey the Evil Flower tells you that this world is kill or be killed. And the enemies you encounter in the game's first section are pretty standard dungeon crawler enemies that are easy and satisfying to knock off. Plus, you appear to be levelling up, so it seems like the right thing to do. There are players who will persevere down this route just to see what happens, safe in the knowledge that once they've found out, they can start a new game and try the other route for size. Carry on right to the end of a kill everything run, however, and you permanently destroy your chances of ever getting a good ending. Restarting the game after killing everyone, looking forward to being the nice guy this time around, you're greeted with a black screen and the sound of howling wind. After 10 minutes of this, the fallen human from the end of your main run addresses you, asking you why you want to return to the world you destroyed. It then agrees to reset the world if you give it your soul in return, which normally, in a video game, we wouldn't think twice about. But when it's Undertale we're talking about, we start to get the feeling that they might be serious. Anyway, any attempted pacifist run after this point is irrevocably soured. This thanks to A, your knowledge of what you did to all these lovable monsters, and B, the actual ending you get after your supposed pacifist run, in which either your character rolls over in bed to reveal that they've been possessed by the fallen human, a violent murderer who's going to kill everyone anyway, Or 
a group photo that revealed basically the same thing, showing you all your friends with their faces crossed out like something you'd find in a serial killer's lair. And if you're playing on PC and think that deleting your game files and reinstalling will fix things, think again, because Undertale saves the fact that you've done the kill everything run to the game's Steam Cloud. Therefore, for as long as you continue to use the same Steam account, you can never wash off the stain of what you've done. Basically, Macbeth, only with more farting skeletons. Which, to be honest, Macbeth could have used more of. What gives, Shakespeare? <laughs> Some high-minded folks say that when you cheat, the only person you cheat is yourself. To which I say, if that's true, why am I banned from the MGM Grand Las Vegas? But setting aside real-world cheating and the MGM's very uncool policy on bringing strong magnets from home, it turns out that when you cheat in vintage N64 platformer Banjo-Kazooie, the person you are mostly cheating is yourself. And the thing you're cheating yourself out of is your precious save game. Once you reach the Treasure Trove Cove in this classic bird and bear em up and then make your way to the Sandcastle, you can use the lettered tiles on the floor to input cheat codes. Isn't that fun? It is fun for as long as the cheat codes you're deploying are the ones you could have ostensibly learned in-game, which have cute or moderately beneficial effects, such as upping your egg carrying capacity, or giving Banjo the tiny head, giant paws, and long stretched out torso that you've always wanted. However, the game deems other, more powerful cheat codes to be illegal, such as those codes that open other worlds. <laughs> If you dare to input two of these codes, then the game's witchy villainess Grunty herself will pop in with an ominous threat. Pretty sure she's bluffing. Witches can't erase save games. Let's go for another cheat. But oh dear, she's not bluffing at all. So you can say goodbye to the save game in your current save slot, which is permanently deleted. Well done, or you've screwed yourself. That's in the N64 original version of the game. In the Xbox version, on the other hand, saving is simply disabled from that point on. So you've irrevocably screwed yourself over in a slightly different way. Again, well done. I think we've all learned an important lesson about cheating here today, which is that you can get away with it twice. Plenty of things can go wrong in Dark Souls, but usually you can just blame the game for being cruel. Oh, Dark Souls, what do you like? But that doesn't mean you can't royally screw yourself over with a problem that's entirely of your own making. There are few friendly faces in the world of Dark Souls, and one of the best is Andre the Blacksmith, who is positioned right next to a convenient bonfire and will upgrade weapons early in the game. Plus, he looks like a big friendly shirtless Santa. Unlike Santa though, it's a lot harder to get off his naughty list. If you choose to test out your new weapon on Andre himself, he'll shrug it off once or twice before going, and we believe this is the technical term, absolutely ham. And while he's an expert weaponsmith who presumably knows his way around a broadsword, when it comes to his own battles, Andre fights with his bare hands and uses pro wrestling inspired moves like this mean drop kick. Is Andre the Blacksmith short for Andre the Giant the Blacksmith? Unfortunately for you, this hostility is permanent. No matter how many times you die and resurrect, like a bloodthirsty elephant, Andre never forgets. 
to murder you. Oh. It's extremely hard to fix this mess, if not utterly irreversible. If you head up to the bell tower behind where you fight the bell gargoyles, you'll find a chap called Oswald of Karim, who apparently serves Velka, goddess of sin. Which must be why he looks like he just arrived straight from an S&M party. He'll absolve you of your sins, meaning any non-player characters you've angered cease to become hostile. The problem is, it'll still ruin your progress because he charges the eye-watering cost of 500 souls for every level you've achieved. And the worst part, he's definitely going to spend it all on fetish wear. Resident Evil Zero tells the story of the Stars team's inexplicably 18-year-old medic Rebecca Chambers, who teams up with sexy bad boy convict Billy Cohen to try and escape the zombie outbreak in the Arclay Mountains. To give you some idea of when it was made, here, sexy bad boy translates to Skeet Ulrich's face and tribal tattoos. Been fantasizing about me, have you? Who had 2002? 10 points. Resident Evil Zero's big innovation was the partner zapping system, in which you played as both Rebecca and Billy, switching between the two on the fly to solve puzzles, fight enemies, and figure out exactly what had happened to cause this zombie outbreak. Spoiler alert, leeches. Leeches happened. About 10 minutes to... What happened? You could also trade items between the two characters, which was good because Billy was a rough and tumble convict who could handle himself in a fight, and Rebecca was an 18 year old science nerd in her first day on the job whose main hobbies were getting bitten by zombies and dying in that order. So it made sense to give most of your good weaponry to Rebecca because she needed it more. Can you see where this is going? Because if you can, you are probably better at Resident Evil Zero than I was. That's right, the game's second boss, the Centurion, is a giant mutated centipede that Billy has to fight on his own. It's not really obvious that a boss fight is on the way, so if you're not paying attention, it's easy to go into this battle unprepared, having given Billy little more to defend himself with than his sweet tats and totally extreme attitude. Hopefully he's at least got a pistol, but when firing your gun requires you to be rooted to the spot, and you're fighting a giant centipede whose mode of attack is to run right at you, you're going to be wishing pretty quickly that Rebecca didn't currently have your shotgun, which she's probably using to prop open a window so she can get some fresh air. Anyway, good luck with the boss fight, particularly when you run out of pistol ammo and have to start trying to use the knife to finish this thing off. Leave this with me, Rebecca. I'll come join you in... Let's say... Six hours. And that's all the internet time we've got time for here today on Outside Xbox. Uh, but if you've got oodles of time, then why not watch some more Outside Xbox videos? Like this one here from Outside Xbox, which is about the unwinnable boss fights that actually, if you're really good and try really hard and believe in yourself, you can win. Or how about for something different, this from our friends at Outside Extra, which is about the seven inanimate objects that you got weirdly attached to. They're very sensitive over there. So check that out as well.